Okay. Um, hi, everybody. I think we're going to get started. Um, I just, uh, I'm the executive director of Video Pool Media Arts Center here. This is our venue, The Output. Uh, I just wanted to say hi and welcome you to our space uh, and just uh, quickly tell you that um, we have an exhibition in our gallery next door. If you want to check it out, um, it's with uh, Visual Aids out of New York. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a part of the um, World AIDS Day, so uh, which was on December 1st. Um, and then I just wanted to also say uh, we have uh, here we're a technology-based art center, uh, and so we have uh, equipment and facilities up on the third floor, and then we have our gallery and the venue here on the second floor. And with that, I just want to say welcome, and uh, I'll pass it over to Jonathan. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Emma. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for taking uh, some time on a, on a weekend to come and join us and learn a little bit about VR. Thanks to all our panelists, who I'll introduce in a second. Um, so this is the Merging Mindset panel on the state of VR. Um, Merging Mindsets is going to uh, expand opportunities for artists to create uh, using digital technologies and uh, broaden connections with uh, the interactive uh, digital media industry and related companies and uh, creative talent here in the city. Uh, we are looking to uh, explore digital tech and art and the art in digital, connect, uh, in digital tech while connecting people in between. Uh, Merging Mindsets is a, a partnership uh, um, between uh, Creative Manitoba, New Media Manitoba, who I work for, uh, and Video Pool, uh, who you've uh, heard from already. And uh, we want to acknowledge the support of the Canada Council for the Arts uh, Digital Strategy Fund, uh, which has let this uh, project happen. Um, before we get to the panelists, uh, I just want to acknowledge that we are on uh, Treaty 1 territory, traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, uh, Dene, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, I would also like to note uh, that we, the intent of this uh, um, roundtable is to foster a supportive, non-threatening environment for everyone uh, and uh, to participate and share in regardless of their gender, ability, ethnicity, or cultural differences. Uh, we ask for you to please be res uh, welcoming, welcoming and respectful to uh, worldviews that are different than your own. Okay. Um, so we've got a great panel of artists and uh, technology uh, leaders here in front of you today. Uh, the format for the, uh, for the afternoon is going to be uh, each panelist is going to have 15 minutes uh, to kind of share some of their experiences uh, with technology, specifically VR. Uh, they're going to break down some projects or talk about all sorts of interesting things, uh, after which uh, we're going to have uh, some questions uh, from myself, and then we're going to open it up to the audience to ask any sort of any sort of questions you have about how you could maybe uh, incorporate VR into your practices uh, or just general technology questions. Um, so, first up, we have Mr. Les Clausen at the far end in the colorful floral shirt. Uh, I'll give you a quick little synopsis of Les. Uh, Les is the CEO and co-founder of Flipside XR, a real-time animation and XR broadcast company that is shaping the future of immersive live broadcast. Wow, what a... What what a what a burden to have on you. That's yeah. <laughs> Les, Les is a great guy and one of the first uh, one of the first in the city to really kind of get excited about the possibilities of VR. Um, some of the work uh, that he's doing right now is with customers like Super RTL, which is co-owned by Disney Television and Caffeine Studios. Uh, in a prior life, uh, Les was an improviser, video director, video director, and interactive designer and synth player. I actually worked with Les on some projects in a former life, and I can also say he has the messiest car of any person I've ever met. <laughs> uh, next up in the line is uh, Willie Lamitri. Lamitri. I can never say that right. Willie's joining us from over uh, from out of town, and we're really excited that he's here in Winnipeg uh, to share some of his knowledge. His work has been featured in galleries across Canada, in New York, at the New Museum. Uh, Wow, really all over the world. Uh, he's, his work uh, with uh, Eric Rosenweg has been co-produced, uh, co-produced pioneering generative and networked artworks, such as The Appearance Machine. Uh, during the last 15 years, he's developed a huge body of uh, immersive work that includes uh, stereo, 3D videos, installations, live VRM, VRML performances, VR, and 3D prints. Uh, so we're very happy that uh, Willie's uh, taking the time to come out to Winnipeg to uh, be with us today. From where? From where? where? You're from Toronto, right? I'm based in Toronto. Yeah, Toronto, yeah. Okay, next up, Mr. Corey King. 
Corey King is an award-winning storyteller and producer who has successfully worked across a range of mediums, including film, publishing, journalism, uh, gallery art, and gaming. Uh, together with his wife, Danielle, uh, King has built uh, Zenfry, a startup that merges art, technology, and business in a whole new way. Uh, Corey's current project is uh, The Last Taxi. Uh, it's a VR project that focuses on topical issues surrounding automation, climate change, transhumanism, class division. And it is set in a world that is politically and economically divided. Uh, he is fully em that has fully embraced human modification, creating a satirical and somberly surreal vision of the future. Uh, Corey's company is based in Winnipeg here, and he was the uh, 2016 recipient of the Future Leaders of Manitoba Award and has been named one of uh, CBC's Manitoba's Future 40. Um, so that's Corey. Next up on the list is Freya Olofsson. Uh, Freya is an intermediate artist who works with video, painting, and performance. Uh, her work engages with identity and the body. It's been informed by technology and, and the internet. Uh, Freya's work has been presented and exhibited internationally, and uh, she's joined the Department of Dance at York University as, as an assistant professor with a speciality in screen dance in 2017. I'm really curious what screen dance is, so hopefully Freya will talk a little bit about that. Um, Freya recently had a, a, a very well-received uh, uh, VR performance uh, uh, show at PTE here, and uh, we're hoping to see more of her work uh, displayed uh, locally and, and nationally. So. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Jonathan Lay. I'm from New Media Manitoba. Uh, we work with the interactive digital media sector here in town. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, some of the services that we provide, just feel free to tap my shoulder after the, uh, after the event. So first up is Mr. Les Clausen on Great. the end, and uh, I'll turn the mic over to you, Les. All right. That, that was a nice mic pass. Um, so yes, uh, my name is uh, Les Clausen, and I want to talk about today around how you can use VR for creativity and um, and just a little bit about uh, our team. So right now we're eight folks and we just got some fancy team photos so I thought I'd share some of those. Uh, I'm the CEO and I've directed uh, more than 10 virtual reality experiences and I presented at Oculus Connect which is um, basically it's Facebook's VR conference and uh, talked about user experience design and virtual reality moons ago. So today's presentation is not about code. So if you are a creator and want to create uh, virtual reality experiences but don't want to program, I'm going to show you all these cool creation apps that are available today that you can incorporate into your art practice. And the point of my talk is just really to touch on what creatives are doing with the medium. So I'm going to start off with painting and sculpting. And in painting and sculpting, the use cases uh, in using VR to paint and sculpt are uh, you can create immersive installations, uh, sculpting for 3D printing, uh, 3D and 2D creation for flat screens. That's what I call TV and uh, computer monitors, flat screens. Um, and in industrial design, I'm going to uh, share a few apps and I'll show short video clips of some of the action that's happening with these apps. So Mozilla, uh, the makers of Firefox, have uh, an app called A Painter and A Painter is uh, a, a full 3D painting app inside your browser. So they're focused on browser-based virtual reality so if you have a headset and a, and a fast enough computer you can surf to the website that says you know, A-Frame Painter and you click a button and you just jump into a virtual painting app. Gravity Sketch. Gravity Sketch is mostly used in industrial design and product design, but people are making art as well. And all of these are available. You can download them on you know, Oculus Home or Steam and uh, you can try these out. Um, another uh, two uh, big painting and sculpting apps, uh, one's called Tilt Brush, so the, the blue image on the right there is a Tilt Brush painting, and uh, some this sculpt here is uh, made by a, a, some, a school in the U.S. called Southern GFX, and they sculpt using virtual reality. And I'm going to show you a video of a sculpt shortly. And then uh, a really good uh, friend of mine actually runs Masterpiece VR. And they do sculpting as well, and they do painting combined, so painting and sculpting in their app. 
And the best way to demonstrate it is to show you this sculpt being made in Masterpiece to get a sense of how it, it's made. They're in a 3D space. Uh, this artist, he is using primitives and tools. And this artist is not a 3D modeler. He, he does not know how to 3D model, but he understands how to create 3D shapes because the sculpting practice is very much tied to the, the physicality of what virtual re reality lets you do. VR is a very physical medium, a very uh, it's three-dimensional, and it's amazing because as humans, we live in a three-dimensional world, so we intuitively get it. And so this is a really has opened up uh, 3D modeling for people who don't do 3D modeling. And uh, this, this, this work can be used in games. It can be used in 3D animation. It could be 3D printed. It all depends on what you want to do. And this was the final render of it. So, so that's an example of sculpting. So that was painting and sculpture. And I'm going to talk to animation and virtual production. So this is the uh, area that my, my company has an app inside of this space. So I'm going to show some of the other apps as well. And then I'll show some stuff that we're doing. So in the animation and the motion capture space, the use cases are immersive animated installations. So where sculpting, you could create a 3D thing in VR. And you can walk around that sculpt. Now you can add animations to these sculpts, so now they become animated. And tools uh, allow these static sculptures to suddenly be posable and movable. You can also use the uh, animation and motion capture software in VR for immersive theater, which we did with the Fringe Festival. It was two years ago now. Um, you can make 3D and 2D flat screen animations. So people are making animations in VR, but showing them on normal flat screens. And then people prototype and they pre-visualize. So here are some uh, apps that are, that are made. So Quill is made by Oculus Story Studio. And there's a, quite a famous virtual reality animated piece called Dear Angelica. And it was made with Quill. Tavori is an animation software that uses three-dimensional. Uh, it's for 3D animation. And it uses keyframing. So key, if anyone knows what keyframing it is, is, you pose an object. And that's one frame. And you pose object in the next frame. And they'll do the computer will figure out how it goes from here to here. It's used all the time in, tr in traditional 3D um, animation. But they have all these tools in VR. And us, and I had to give us a full screen, of course. Um, so this is an example of flip side. So we, we, uh, we, make, we use motion capture. That's what our, 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 our core function of our app is. We use motion capture to power cartoon characters or 3D characters to make shows. And we have a, a customer in the US. I'm going to show you what we're doing with them. But I wanted to show you first what it looks like before they get into VR. So this is, I, I always say this is a great future of work panel or slide, because this is, these are all um, actors. There's also a director and, and a team of people behind the scenes that are all in VR in real time making this show. And I'll show you a little clip of that. <laughs> Hit your daily woe. You got it. <laughs> Hit the woe. Hit the woe. Okay. Live from the Eighth Dimension is an interactive live animation show where chat is involved. Dormius wants to know if you enjoy hugs. I love to wrap myself around a person and hug them until they can't breathe. And other guests, like a late night talk show, and then there's also some narrative comedy. I apologize I'm... for the tardiness. I got a bit lost on the way to the studio. Uh huh. <laughs> the real way to watch this show is live, and that is because it does feel like. Uh, Everything's sort of off the cuff. The show's very light and funny. It feels very improvisational. Were you ever in a cake? I have jumped out of a cake once for a bachelorette party. Yes, wow. What was I the did. reaction? Not good. When it gets down to it, it's fly by the seat of your pants. Amy and Roach are riffing with each other. The guests that we have on the show are amazing improvisers. Whirly, I love you. I Got love some you. fans oh, in the yes. chat. Aw, you, you have a soul, can I have it? Our director is directing in VR. Like he's in on set in VR with all of these things around him in VR, switching cameras, the things that they're able to do now with the technology 
I have a feeling would probably surprise the people who are creating the technology. Another thing that makes Live from the Eighth Dimension so unique is that the viewers are watching live and our audience can interact with us, but you can be any, any level of involved. You can watch it from the sidelines and not really join in, or you can type as many chats as you want. Hello Earthlings, come chat with me, Amy, Robot Kyle, every Thursday, 6 p.m. Pacific, live, only on Caffeine. So, so that is an example of, uh, so that company uses our software to power that show. They make an hour of animated content a week. There are 32 hours of animated content this year and it's kind of, kind of mind blowing to see uh, how other people use the work that you do. And I wanna show you one little other quick thing that actually demonstrates. Hi. So I'm doing a pitch as a stick man so here. So voice or any intellectual But I wanna show you, around. I'm gonna pause it and say, as you can see on the right hand side, we have camera switchers. If you're, in, if you're in the television industry, you'd recognize this very clearly, where you can switch cameras and you have the main actor in the front and this is how the interface looks like uh, for the, uh, uh, kind of, because you can't see all of it because we're not in VR, but I'm just trying to show that we really mimic a uh, television studio and that's how we kind of go about doing our app. Um, there are some other apps that I want to show you as well quickly. Okay, so also um, this is an example of pixels. Um, so this is a, a, an a improviser who's actually at this point is actually playing, a, is a woman playing a man, uh, improvising live on a stage. And it was, uh, what was it, uh, 10, 10 episodes, we did 10 uh, shows and they were all sold out and they made 30 short vignettes, three animated vignettes over a period of two weeks. Um, another app that I mentioned Quill, I'll show you some Quill stuff which is really cool. Um, so Quill is, uh, it's, this is all artwork that's made in Quill and it's hand painted. These are like interactive little areas to explore. None of this requires programming. No, all of this requires uh, is learning interfaces like Photoshop. If you can do Photoshop, you can do any of these, these programs. They have timelines and tools. And so VR has become a really powerful creation medium. And that's why we made Flipside, because we, are, uh, we just love the idea of being creative and empowering people to be creative. And I'll show you a little bit more about the next kind of stuff happening in this space. Um, I'm just going to show you clips, I think. It's probably even better that way. Um, here's one called uh, Anim VR, and it's another animation company. <coughs> and this is all frame-by-frame um, -frame stuff. So we did motion capture stuff, so you could do a live. This is you paint frame by frame. And it just, um, it's amazing the physicality of VR makes things so much easier. And the fact that you can see the palette in front of you. And now, so this is Anim VR. Um, there's a ton of animation apps uh, that are coming out right now. Then I'm gonna get into uh, world building and uh, social VR. I'm gonna show you, uh, there's one called Neos and Anyland. I'll show you Anyland. So Anyland is a, uh, I'll just load it up and I'll just pause it. So Anyland is like a world building place where you can craft your own worlds. Um, so I would actually just call them installations, not just worlds, but people use world building. And this has a, 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 a fairly simple interactive language system. So you can do things like, when I, put, when, I, when I make my hand go through this object, it turns a light on or it opens up a door or that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna show you this guy, this user's name is, is Jinx and his, this is his apartment and I'll show in you. any land. Hit that button, the book pops up. And then here, like I said, I have the different teleport spots. Headquarters, that's my home world. Jinx apartment, you know, the mansion, the underground, and then friends places, good stuff. And these are the spawners, so you know, the light. Boom, there it is. Ooh, down the hallway to my bedroom. Yes, of course, this is Jinx's apartment. This is my apartment's area in the Fazzy's apartment complex. And I'll show you. So they're building whole nice worlds together. Aquarium. So there's yeah. groups of people building the apartment complexes that open up to mansions, Fazzy. that open up to underground water things to whatever and people when want. You're there, you can hit the door that's And there are the creation gym. tools inside this app that let you craft everything. So everything that you see here has been made in the app. 
it's great for prototyping. If you're into prototyping Correct ideas place, and you don't want to do programming, it has the whole programming Come language on. inside of it as well. And there's people that you meet online in their, in their digital persona. So Jinx, for example, is someone who is a digital avatar primarily. I don't know Jinx's name. But it's just Jinx. Um, I want to show you uh, Neo. This is another one. This is... Neos comes with many different brush templates that you can spawn into the world and try out, which is cool, but they all have one thing in common. There's no user interface to customize how the brush behaves. That's where these so special this, features So this this actually the red one this, is the line this brush. This user is giving you a tutorial right now, and the but green one has created this whole brush. world. All three of these and operate similarly. And these apps have robust world-building interactive the tools inside of them. So yeah. I always think if there are any people who want to explore installations that, without that actually physically building much, things and want to play with them, my part. But these types of tools are great for that. Which lets you extract any material from this panel or your environment to use as a brush stroke. And there is an option to project your brush strokes onto the surface of objects, making it an excellent highlighter tool, or in the case of the foliage brush, a ridiculously lazy way to decorate an environment like what I've done here. So you can see already, um, you know, he, he's explaining all these, uh, how he decorates his environment. But when you get inside these worlds, um, you can see other people's environments and explore them. They're very social. And um, so they're also scary as well. So it's good. There's, there's some, some social worlds are a little toxic, you know, just like on every, you know, Reddit can be a pretty toxic place sometimes. So can places like VR chat. So VR chat's another example of one of these social worlds that has a bit of a reputation of being a bit toxic right now. So if you are, are, are you care about the safety of, of your of your kids, then I would say it's very important that you understand some of these things. Um, however, there's always there's always really interesting, wonderfully great, amazing people inside of these worlds too. But discerning that is a, a process that has not been figured out yet. Um, see if I have any more clips to show you what some of these creation tools. Um, I'm going to show you um, that tilt brush as well. It's it's, it's super corporate-y, but. So this is this is like considered like the Microsoft Paint of VR. It is more of like lots of glowy things and sparkles and things like that. But um, lots of people are creating really beautiful artwork uh, inside of Tilt Brush, and it's it's the thing that I want to really get across in my portion of the talk is is that you don't necessarily need to be a programmer. Two, as human beings, we live in 3D space. It's amazing how intuitive it is to move into an art creation area that is in 3D because we understand intuitively 3D. And I would I would argue for those who are nervous about getting into virtual reality, to, it's there's enough tools today that you don't have to really worry about it. It's more time and more opportunity to play. But I really think uh, if there's any skepticism about, you know, is VR accessible to, to yourself, that I think that's gone already. And it's just, that's the point I really wanted to make. So, so we make a creation app. These are some other creation apps. And uh, I hope that anyone here who is interested in making content is inspired to explore it. And I know that Video Pool has a VR headset. And if you get a membership there, I know you can play with VR, and I know there's a few other places in town. I'm not quite sure, like On Screen Manitoba and a few other places too, but that's, that's my talk, thanks. Thanks so much, Les. Uh, I'm sure you've all got lots of questions about uh, uh, some of the tools that uh, Les was demoing, but uh, just keep them in mind, and uh, for, the, for the end of the presentation, uh, we'll pass uh, the mic over to Willie uh, in a second, as soon as he gets set up. Yeah. Okay, Willie, uh, the I mic's all yours. Thanks. Uh, I, I appreciate that talk too, uh, as, as I know that it, it can be really difficult um, and very counterintuitive, uh, the environments of making VR, but these tools are clearly, um, you know, intuitive and, and um, uh, I know, like, just as an example, a 3D uh, authoring tool um, is, is notoriously, like Maya or something, is notoriously, like, opaque. Um, but like stepping into Tilt Brush, it, it's like in, 
an incredible like uh, freedom, uh, and it, and it just it, you can do no wrong almost like a, so it's thanks. Um, so my talk. Um, hi, thanks, thanks for coming, thanks for having me here. Um, I want to talk about uh, some projects I've been doing uh, with VR. Uh, but I would like to focus uh, before that on uh, certain um, maybe notions about uh, the build-up to VR and um, reflect on some of uh, my trajectory in um, sort of approaching it. Because I consider VR um, something like a, mm, like a sort of... Uh, not an ult ultimate um, form, but it, 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 it certain certain inclinations towards the image. Um, it it uh, it's a breakthrough uh, and a new media, new medium. Um, so thinking about uh, the image, um, I, I I look back at, at the work I've been doing uh, as an artist. Uh, goes back quite a while. Um, it all of it, um, and it it's it's varied in in spanning mediums and and uh, periods and collaborations and um, so on. But it, it all is regarding image. I, I I'm I'm dealing with image uh, always, um, and I think um, you know our bias towards image is is um, uh, towards it is is. Uh, it's understandable uh, in that I, I think that we are all images in, in some ways in, in the sense that uh, what we see, appearance, our thoughts, our dreams are all in, in, this, um, in this form. Um, and that's where it kind of, it gets conflated with uh, virtual reality in that um, it's sort of, um, it's, it's as though you're entering into the images um, and this is, um, I don't know, it, I think of it as a, as a, a sort of new sensibility uh, around Im the image, and I think about it as a, an experience image where um, meaning, um, uh, sim symbolism is, is, is uh, somehow like surpassed by just the pure experience of an image of being in, in an image and it's a sort of anthropological uh, turn um, and it's sort of uh, the approach to it through high definition um, interactivity networked uh, networked images are are sort of the build-up to that um, so I First came across VR in uh, in the mid '90s in the f sort of VR uh, 1.0 uh, period, where like um, it was very expensive and um, uh, difficult and um, hard to access, and basically wasn't wasn't ready uh, for um, artists. Although there were some notable projects. Uh, in, in Banff, I encountered someone I was passing through there, and um, Char Davies, Osmos, in um, at Isaiah in 1995, and it, it's amazing that these these projects so long ago they they actually um, aesthetically, technically, they they they're actually on par. My sort of I I knew it would come around again. Um, uh, but I, I sort of came to it through um, getting into stereographic video, um, finding that um, the, the distinction between 2D and 3D video was was a sort of a sense of presence within the image, and um, I I sort of realized that I wanted to explore uh, space time and sort of get into a 3D space and 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 just experiment in it and um, there was a, a tool that was built uh, in the 90s called VRML and uh, it allowed you to uh, write uh, code, simple code like mark, like HTML uh, to uh, produce a, a 
a live stereo rendered in OpenGL um, virtual reality, except the headsets and so on weren't, weren't there. But anyway, it sort of got, got, got me going. And um, the first project that I made in was, I guess, around between 2005 and 10 was um, this uh, work called Idea, which is, uh, there's a, a sort of illustration of the, the project, uh, and it's Idea, the, the Idea, Idea's individual, uh, the distributed self in digital space. And um, it's sort of, it brought a lot of ideas together around uh, what digital space was seeming to be uh, then, and uh, has, has come to be more so as a, um, a space that is um, non-continuous, a space that is creative, uh, collaborative, um, and, uh, and, and so on, a, a space that uh, virtual reality became. And um, so what this piece was, was a, a, a sort of um, nested structure of spheres. Uh, I thought of it as a kind of, um, architecture of affect where the basic molecule uh, com consisted of um, a structure uh, of nodes interconnected that um, uh, e each one um, personified by a, a friend and it was it composed of um, recordings uh, of communications I had with these people and you would sort of navigate it as a sort of a sonic uh, hologram and uh, sort of shifting between conversations and drifting in and out. Uh, the spheres were um, sort of uh, nested one another in, in the sense that uh, uh, one could be a, an influencing force on, a, on another, uh, one could be a conceptual force that um, uh, such as um, desire um, and um, mm, the uh, astrology and uh, things like that, sort of an analog to the, the stars. Um, memory, this is the, uh, the one for the eye. Uh, so it was um, recording video and encoding it into uh, a memory pool, um, that pool below. Um, but anyway, um, this this uh, uh, sort of was the 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 build up to to um, finally getting into VR in um, um, maybe three 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 years ago or so. Um, but uh, I I sort of um, uh, let me see. I'll just move on to that. So I started to do uh, work with, um, uh, first with the Android, um, but I found that it wasn't uh, fast enough. Um, and I was able to um, get together um, uh, a Vive headset and um, made uh, uh, f first experiments that uh, were elaborated over, over a year or two into the first piece. Uh, which is uh, the Clear Lake Archipelago. And what this was was also a, a, a meditation on, uh, this is a still from, from it. Um, let me switch over to the video. So what it was and, and turned out to in, in presentation was uh, a projection installation that would project uh, a composite image of the uh, what was in the headset uh, that the participant would see, and then uh, an external camera within the virtual space on the on the uh, participant as they went through it. And sort of the idea behind uh, displaying it like this was to um, I wanted to make this distinction between uh, cinema, which is a screen-based, um, where you're, the, the viewer is separate, to one where you enter the image and um, you know put the headset on and experience it. And also, I, I didn't want to have um, a situation where 
the documentation was, you know, somebody with a headset on, and it's sort of that ubiquitous image of virtual reality. Uh, you know, I wanted to sort of try to turn it into something else. Um, and so what it was, was, um, and is, is um, a piece where it also uh, looks at digital space um, as a sort of uh, screen space like in the idea, but uh, something where um, there's, a, there's a, a concept of land and uh, a concept of um, it being submersed. And it's sort of like vague doom uh, sort of ambience of, of our current, uh, current situation. So, um, So when you, you enter it, um, you enter a, a, a puppet, and uh, that's the sort of your, your avatar, and um, the participant will um, be able to gesture with their hands and see them, and uh, it's using a leap motion sensor that's affixed to the, the headset and they can point at things and, and advance and, and explore the, the piece. Um, so this is the, the avatar that uh, the participant is inhabiting. And in front of their face, you see uh, the features of the, the face of the, the puppet and it speaks a narrative uh, and the narrative is a sort of reflection of the uh, the condition and uh, the, the sort of dislocation of, of, of being in digital space. Um, and the, you'll see when it puts up it, its hands, the sort of the, these, these tendrils that reach out and they act, they're reaching out to other puppets that you'll see in a moment. And um, as you sort of explore the situation, uh, you'll, you'll notice that there are, there are five uh, individuals around you and you're not sure whether uh, when you reach up and you see this, this, your hand connected to theirs and, and you actually see another hand inside your hand and you, you have basically five hands in your hands and it's, it's kind of strange uh, but it, um, it, uh, it's ambiguous whether you're sort of controlling them or, or they're getting you to, to, to move. Uh, um, so, this, um, this situation, what I was trying to do with the piece, okay, this is what, uh, so you'll see, this is the, the image that appears before you when you're, uh, when you're in it. Um, and, uh, so I was, I was interested in, in VR as a, as a, it's fundamentally, it's a stereographic, uh, in, by binocular uh, medium. And I was interested in the idea of um, that perhaps a digital space is, is in its sort of imminent uh, character. Uh, really, maybe it's not appropriate that it, that it, uh, that it have depth. It, you know, perhaps it, it's uh, something that would be more appropriate, a, a, a new abstract space where um, you know, ev everything was sort of, um, you know, a lot more intuitive and accessible. And, uh, you know, this, this, this sort of replication of, of our physical space was, was sort of uh, uh, an anomaly. Um, so the way I did this was uh, I made these, these islands and then you, you enter the piece and you, you sort of go underwater and you encounter these uh, these, these islands, which are really made of um, uh, scanned, photo scanned um, objects and, and places, and uh, I think of these as, as, as fossils of, of these places, and um, and I populated them with the, these uh, characters that were uh, translucent or transparent, and they acted as sort of uh, lenses and there's lo lots of water flying around and um, these sort of optical uh, 
tricks. Uh, but looking into the, the, the characters, you, you actually see uh, this distortion of space and, and, and things that are far seem very close. And um, something else that's, that's, that's in it is um, there's a, a, a way to design a, a, a camera so that um, the back buffer of, of the, um, the 3D render doesn't update. And it, it, um, it has a, a strange effect of um, causing both the, the, that part in, in, in the very background of the image to um, be identical in the, the left and the right image, whereas the the rest of the image is a stereo image, so you see in, in depth. So this thing in the, the background, it has the effect of, of um, being pulled really close. So there's this really strange distortion of space, which um, worked very well with the, the sort of underwater um, thing and, and, and this idea of, of, of twisting space. Um, so, um, yeah, that's... that's um, that's sort of the, the, the essence of that piece. Um, now I made, um, currently I'm working on uh, another piece, where is it? Oh, here it is. So one thing I find about, um, um, VR is, is, is how, how much it is suited towards performance and, and real-time um, engagement. And I think Freya uh, best, best demonstrates that. Um, but this is, um, so this is a demo of, that was sort of the space you're about to see in, in the video. And the piece is, this is strictly a demo, uh, but it's, it's using a, a headset that has a stereo camera uh, on the front of it. So you see in 3D space, um, but you, um, um, you're able to, to mix in um, 3D graphics and they appear coherently as, uh, as you know, you're seeing the room. And what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm processing uh, with a shader uh, the, the video signal so that it, it creates this sort of um, otherworldly or whatever, like a sort of more psychedelic looking space, which has a really uncanny connection with, um, with the physical reality. So when, when you touch something, uh, there's this sort of um, just optical connection, disconnection uh, with the physical sensation of touching the object. So the piece, as I'm seeing it, it's what you're seeing now is like these sort of real-time things that you can interact with. These objects are emitting and you can catch them and hold them. And so there's this water bubble um, there and you can sort of move it around. And so I'm playing with ideas around uh, the cell and um, the environment, basically, and the sort of interconnection of, of, of parts and, and um, the sort of um, vastness of, of, of life. Um, and um, so it's a sort of uh, a, maybe a five to seven minute cycle where this phenomena um, sort of occurs and um, there's soft sculptures uh, where the these, these phenomena occur of or are centered on. And so it's a sort of narrative um, presented in a tent. Um, so uh, to, to the public that visits the installation, they'll see the sort of ambiguous uh, scene of, of sculptures and things dangling and uh, this, this person inside uh, sort of tentatively moving around or sitting down or doing whatever they're doing, interacting with the objects. And um, the tent itself is a, is a kind of, um, it's a sort of sculpture in, in, in its own. own uh. So yeah, that's, that's uh, it's a work in progress what you're seeing here. But uh, 
that's uh, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Corey King, everybody. All right. Uh, all this talk makes me extremely nervous. I was explaining to uh, my co-speakers, I guess that, uh, and you'll see that when I when I show a, a little bit of like my trajectory and the things I've worked on, and it kind of is a mess of different things which I think is representative of like living a day in the life in my head, and I'm not saying it's pretty, um, but like there's so much cool stuff going on that it makes me really anxious about, you know, there's so much to explore and you only have so much time. Um, anyway, a little bit about us. Uh, you know, he did some in the opening, so I won't necessarily uh, retouch that, but, uh, you know, we pride ourselves on basically st being storytellers. Whatever medium we work in, it's all about uh, storytelling for us. Um, and so we approach sometimes things in different ways. Sometimes it's like, wow, VR is really cool. Let's find something to tell within VR. And other times it's like, here is a cool idea. What is the best way to tell it? And you know, I sort of, I sort of look at the stuff you've done, and, and I, I have that longing in my heart to go back and be uh, more experimental again. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's always like that. But we're basically media agnostic uh, in that sense. Like, you know, we hope to do some TV someday. We hope to go back and do traditional theater. Um, and I think that for, for the sake of this talk, that's where it's going to be uh, maybe interesting for you guys because you come from an eclectic mix of backgrounds. And I have touched upon a, uh, a lot of different stuff. So there is a, a picture of my wife, who's my business partner, hand painting paper frames that we printed for an animation. Uh, which is labor intensive. I started the process and then gave up and she finished the process, which is uh, kind of typical of anything that's overly difficult. Um, we published uh, an anthology of written and visual works. I've directed films. Uh, and we've done gallery shows. Um, and essentially, you know, the point being like, my job across all these mediums is essentially the same. You do need to have some understanding, you know, sentence structure to write and you need to know how to edit a little bit to make film. But usually you can find people who really know how to do that stuff. If you want to be the core of a project, um, you really just need that creative vision and, and so an understanding of what the medium provides to really uh, excel and do it. And I'm also a creative that like, I probably actually couldn't do what you do because I'm useless on my own. Like I, like I need people. So all my projects are, are team oriented. Um, and I had to learn to be a team player to do that. Uh, just a little bit about some of the places we've been written about. Um, Le Monde is like the New York Times of uh, France, the Atlantic Wired, things like that. This is one of my uh, favorite ones. Uh, it's old, but it's in German. It was in German until I Google Translate it. The King of Augmented Reality. Um, I still haven't got the crown. I'm not really sure what's involved in this. Uh, nothing has come of that royal treatment. Um, and some awards, and they're a smattering from, from all over the world. The Inside AR is from uh, Germany. Uh, AWE finalist is a San Francisco thing. Uh, the Technology Expo is in the UK, et cetera. Um, on my, my last project, which was a, an AR project, and I am going to touch on AR and VR, um, which is, you know, I, his sort of last thing qualifies as AR, so I don't feel like it's quite a cheat anymore, um, is, uh, yeah, it, it, it did all right. And uh, there's just some pictures of some other talks I've done and uh, a, a press conference that the government once held for me which is all very awkward. Um, so what we do, um, essentially I'm going to, because this killed out, I'm gonna sort of play a, play a quick demo reel to just sort of give you an, a sense of like all the different things we do and it's gonna have a mix of AR, VR projects and uh, older projects. Did I open the right thing? Yes, I did. And it's already running, but I have no audio, so that's good. Just one second. Is it going out the right way? Oh, you can hear audio? Yeah, crackling. Oh, okay, it, that's correct. It's crackling. Okay. Um, so I tried to go for a vibe that might fit video pool in terms of, uh, you know, this is the, a bit from The Last Taxi. This is a touch table that we worked on. This is a cinematic from an AR game. Uh, this is sort of film. This is an AR museum installation that we worked on. Uh, this is a augmented reality location-based thing. Um, for an event that we did. Um, so it's sort of we've, we've touched on this technology. Uh, this is like an experimental animation that was a art installation. Uh, and there's so, sort of some more AR stuff. Um, so essentially like um, 
where there's the crater tools and, and, and like we have not really been focused in any way in, in, in what we undertake, but that gives us an interesting perspective of like, what is the difference between a museum installation when you're coming to do AR or VR content versus a video game that you want to play everywhere. And so most of my talk is going to be literally going through uh, some of the projects I've done and just giving you like the pros and cons of like the technology, the state of the technology at the time, little lessons and things like that uh, that we learned um, throughout. Um, so I'll just come back to, there's a, oh wait, this thing's gonna make me go back from the beginning. I, I don't know how to use this program. Um, okay. There we go. Um, so yeah, that's just sort of like a smattering of work. And there's little hints in here of some other stuff that isn't necessarily announced, but uh, we might be able to talk about a little bit. There's a bit of a comic book thing going on there that may be VR related, and it may not happen. And that's the thing I also want to tell you guys. Like, you've seen sort of a, a pretty good already, like a little eclectic, I call it the eclectic cut of what we do. Um, but like for everything that gets done, there's like massive files of probably torturable ideas. Some of them are good ideas that you just don't get off the ground. So the stuff here that we haven't done yet, like the comic book or the, the little Munchy Guys, which is a, an AR game that we do have a demo of, um, may or may not happen. I have no idea. The rest of it sort of has been done in different capacities, though. Um, so in terms of projects, so the first project uh, I'm going to talk about was uh, my first game project ever. I literally went from that book called War Paint, which was a, an anthology of written and visual works where we had writers and artists from all over the world contribute, to like a location-based AR game. And that was the first kind of piece of software we ever built. Um, and there's, so, there's some lessons in terms of being early. So the, the kind of, the important things to know about this is we started this project before Ingress, which is like Google's uh, first AR thing. We were working on this before that was even announced. We released after, but we did release before Pokemon Go by about a year. Uh, so very, very early. And it actually comes a little bit from what you're saying about like how the space fills you or it changes you. Like I came from film and there's this whole like slight snobbishness perhaps about the size of the screen versus other mediums. Like we, ours is bigger, our canvas is bigger. Um, and I sort of didn't, I was like, well the whole world is bigger than any movie screen. So could I use my phone? I didn't even know AR as a term, by the way, when I started this. It's like, could I use a phone? There's, there's maybe enough in here to like paint on the world. Um, and that was kind of the basic idea. Then I realized somebody had already thought of that idea and called it AR. But um, it was about location-based storytelling. Um, in terms of the design requirements, we wanted it to be something that was the same experience for everyone everywhere. So like even now when you play Pokemon Go, if you play it in the middle of the country, it's not as compelling of an experience as if you play it elsewhere. And we also wanted it where you could do the location-based and play everything without internet connection. You, knit, you download the stuff at the beginning and it will play anywhere, which is not the same for these other games either, but those are some of the design restrictions. But the thing is, back then there was not easily accessible stuff. The technology we built it with was called Mateo, which is a company based in Germany, does not exist anymore. Um, and that makes it tough when you're coming in that early to keep supporting your games and your ideas. So this thing took me over four years to make. It costed a lot of money and it you know, employed a lot of people, but the game is dead already, basically, because Mateo doesn't exist they got bought by Apple right before I launched my game. And they took away all of the developer support tools. And so literally your thing becomes time locked, you know? And, and, uh, and so I'm not saying don't do innovative things, but just be, be somewhat aware of what the landscape looks like when you're doing it. Because um, you could be biting off more than you could chew, which is certainly true of this project. But also just, you know, I feel at least now VR, because it has Oculus and it has like Valve, you know, it has widespread industry support that makes it a little bit safer. Little, well, of course, <laughs> we're working in the soundless black and white TV of virtual reality, right? And we have to remember that. Like, how many of you go watch silent films? Well, maybe it's the wrong crowd at video pool, but like, generally, people don't watch those films anymore. Um, and so you got to remember that everything's going to be deprecated um, at some point. Now, when it comes to like the pros and cons of of this game, so you get a lot of credit for being first, uh, which is why I've been able to do talks all over the world. I mean, literally, like a lot of that happened before anyone even played the game. So it's like, wasn't even about the quality of what I did or didn't do. It was like, just trying to create that thing. 
Um, and uh, at the time, we were the largest scale AR game that anyone had ever attempted. Uh, and I still think, like, at the end of the game, not that anyone can play it to verify what I'm saying at this point, but, uh, you know, the most characters on screen, you know, like, uh, Pokemon Go has, like, one Pokemon you catch originally at launch. We had, like, you know, 27 things flying around that you could dynamically shoot and hit um, when we did it. But like I said, the con is, like, you, you'll, you can lose the tools. Um, you can lose the support. Uh, you know, to reopen this and try to push an update to make it compatible with new phones would be, you'd have to rebuild the game, essentially. So, um, the, con, the second con of being too early is, fortunately, when you have Facebook explaining to you what VR is, you don't have to do it. And once Pokemon Go came out, it was actually easier to sell my game, and I actually made more sales post-Pokemon Go than before Pokemon Go, because beforehand, you're going to normal consumers and saying, uh, I have this location-based augmented, re and I don't know what he's talking about. I don't know what the Zenfry thing is of this company or who this crazy-haired guy is. I normally have large curly hair. Um, and, uh, and so it makes it hard to sell. But as soon as something comes out that is established, like Pokemon Go, you can say, it's like this, but, you know, we still have a hard time selling VR in a lot of ways, right? But the industry support definitely helps, and that's something to consider if you're ever too early. Now, uh, a lot of projects in here were done with uh, another company in the city. We often take on the art and design side, and they do a lot of the technical work. Uh, and this would be an example of that. This is actually a project I was subcontracted on by Bitspace. And so the, the clandestine anomaly was like a dream project that turned into a, like a nightmare to make. But, um, but it was a dream project. It was like going for the stars, trying to make the coolest thing possible. This was more of like a client project um, and I used to not want to ever do client projects, but if there's something fun or something to learn in it, I sort of take it on. But what happens is you have to look at the context of what you're making very, very differently. So this is both a training game, which has implications on your design, but the design also was supposed to work on everything. There's a web version of the game. There's a mobile version. They want it to work on Steam, like, uh, like the high-end stuff. And that can make it extremely challenging. Like, it's good. The pro of that is it hits everybody. And the pro of working on a client project like this is that its life cycle is very different than if you try to release to the public. One, you don't have to, like, market the same way. You know, the client kind of handles it. There's, like, a built-in audience. But there's also more longevity in theory because they'll continue to use that product. It's smaller. It's less, like, sexy. But it, like, it lasts a lot longer. But the difficulty is to design something that's supposed to work on all these different devices, all these different specs, it just becomes really hard to know where to put your focus. Um, and, and even like in the art, the art has to be sort of like simpler, and will that simple art hold up on a high-end device? Uh, another project, which was an AR project, uh, and this one was one that I led, uh, but Bitspace still helped on the, on the code side of it, um, was called Cinemental, and this one was crazy. This was like, uh, Anytime a client like lets me do whatever I want, I spend more than all of the money they gave me. I spend my own money a lot. Because even though it's a client project, I still care too much, probably. Um, and in this case, like, uh, you know, they gave us a, a very small amount of money, and I said, I'm going to transform the whole city into an AR game. Uh, and on a small budget, like Clandestine, that other game, it was a location-based game with a huge budget. No markers needed. Anyone could play it anywhere. But especially at the time, that was very costly. With, a, with something like this, there's not a lot of money. What is the cheapest way you can make a location-based game? And that was kind of like the idea of this, which is that we printed, and that's literally like an AR marker on the one side there. You, we, we printed a bunch of markers and physically distributed the markers all over the city. And then we had a map inside the app where people could find the posters. Um, and, and it worked pretty good in theory. Like, you know, you could go and, you know, you go, and when you scan the posters, that kind of tacky looking AR, clearly AR poster, transforms into, say, historic posters from the event or behind the scenes information. And then you would unlock content on your phone that gave you the history. And as you unlocked everything, you basically had like the history of the festival for 25 years. The problem is posters don't stay in place. Uh, people move them. And if your app is trying to represent where those posters are, that means every time you hear a poster moved, you have to put it back, maybe find a better spot, get the app people to update the app to move the thing so that people aren't going to the wrong spot. That part's not really advisable. The fact that this was a festival that had like a two week duration made that like doable, but like in the long term that is very, very hard. But using markers is still the cheapest way to do augmented reality content. Um, it's not like the sexiest way to do AR content, but it, it, it's, um, 
it's the easiest. So you saw in the video like uh, the museum exhibit, and this is the same app as that, but updated. The whole idea of this one was we, um, same thing, the client just said like do whatever, um, and I was like, great. Uh, and so we actually took the Morden Fossil Discovery Center and we, and we decided to make an AR experience that went throughout the entire museum. And it's a little bit like a collectible game. You go in and you find these AR markers that are dig sites, and to collect the bone and dig it out, you had to answer trivia, and the trivia was only answerable by reading the exhibit. I find a lot of technology tries to be disruptive to existing content. It's like come over and look at the shiny new VR thing, ignore all of the content that's already in the museum, and we felt that what we wanted to do is use AR to get people who would not normally engage with that content to, to, to gamify that and engage in it. So you basically, as you answer it, you build a complete dinosaur. Um, and, and the other thing with this one is, I, I hate QR codes, like I hate them. Like uh, they're ugly and they're disgusting. So, so, so the challenge with this one was we, we, we didn't want to put a bunch of AR codes throughout a museum. At least I didn't want to. Like it kind of distracts from the aesthetics of the, of the building. So we put a lot of effort into making these markers look like art themselves. You know, they were still noticeable. Users would still understand this is a game thing. But, you know, if you're not playing the game, they're just a thing that's there that's sort of like some cute art. The downside of that is QR codes work almost every time on almost every device. And when you try to make something that looks aesthetically pleasing, even though it's still a marker, getting that to work on everything is very, very tough. And we actually spent most of our time on this one just getting markers to work properly. Because to make them pretty and to make them functional are two different things usually. Um, and then even still, you'll test it on like 20 devices, you'll deploy it, and then you'll get some note about some guy with some Google phone that you never heard of and it doesn't work for him. Uh, okay. Fortunately, now a lot of that's going away. Like those are the limits of, 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 of using markers and that will probably always exist. But now there's AR Kit, which is uh, by Apple and there's also AR Core. Um, and we basically took this on. This happened right when AR Kit came out. It was probably one of the first, and we did this with Bitspace as well. Uh, this is one of the first projects I probably, like, you know, that weren't, like there's companies who are on the inside, like Ikea, who worked with Apple for AR Core, but we, we pretty much made this right when it came out. And it was a product app. Um, this is the, like, my artistic side cries a little bit every time about this, because it's like you made virtual toilets. Is that really you? Um, but we got to use AR Kit, and we did learn a lot about AR Kit and, and AR generally. Um, so what's nice about AR Kit is if someone has a compatible phone, first of all, with markers, people don't really know if they have a compatible phone or not. With AR Kit, it's like up to Apple to, to do that and their phone works or it doesn't work. But if it does work, the experience is fairly reliable and so you can design it a little bit more specifically to those, to those products. Um, the main design features we had to achieve here was try to make them look as lifelike as possible, try to make them feel weighty, and uh, have a, animations. It was actually like the IKEA app, I still don't know if IKEA app has animations, but at the time the IKEA app was all sort of flat objects that you place, like 3D, but like they didn't do anything. Ours is like faucets, and to show off a feature of a faucet, the water needs to move. So we, so we had a big challenge of trying to figure out how to show that stuff in the app, and make it run on your phone. Like, so, so they have this thing of like, it's gotta look as real as possible, and it's gotta run on a phone. And, and, and AR has, just like VR, a, a heavy overhead. Like the calculations that that phone is making to like figure out the floor space takes overhead on the phone and it gets hot if you run too much graphics on it. So it, it, it's trying to find all of those balances. So the pro is like AR Kit to me was a blessing and it was very painful because I knew how hard it was to do it before AR Kit came along. And, and now it was a much easier thing to do. You can do it on low budget and smaller teams. Apple support legitimizes it a little bit. Apple saying that AR is ready, regardless if it is or not, is a lot easier than me saying AR is ready. Um, early on though, it lacked a lot of features. So we still face that whole like being early incumbents into it. And things that are e easy to do today, like how light casts on objects, we had to like find ways to fake it. Because partly what tells you that that object's not really there is that it's not really reacting with the lights. It's just sort of finding a general ambience. And the worst part about our products versus like IKEA products, which are usually presented in matte, is like the faucets shine. And that's what makes them pretty. And they even had us do a mirror, which I was like, I don't know who said that, that we should do a mirror in AR because it's never gonna work, um, but we had to try to make it work. And so like to try to make that reflectivity look real while we can't really have it reflecting you, things like that, 
all huge challenges, um, but it's doable, and, and there's more support uh, for this stuff now, and now you can hook stuff up onto walls. Ultimately, I think the con across all of these AR apps is your phone, because it's, it's, like, it's just not that fun to do this and hold this up. It's not that immersive. For VR, you put on goggles and it's super immersive. So I really kind of at this point think AR is not really gonna go anywhere mass market until there is those glasses, because there's always that barrier. It's like a nice gimmick. It's like, it's cool to look at initially, but like, what's the Angry Birds of AR? I guess that's Pokemon Go, but Pokemon Go is not really AR. It's more location-based. AR is like an extra little feature. Um, so then there is a, another game we're working on right now. This is uh, similar in that it's a VR for education, similar to the, the safety training app. Uh, but the difference is it is spec'd only to hit low-end devices. So that, that in some ways is a blessing and a curse. Low-end devices suck. You know, you can't count on input. Like the coolest part about VR is reaching out and touching things. But like if you know that they only have a mobile phone and, uh, and like they might not even have a button, but you're still supposed to make it feel tactile, that's a, that, that's a big design challenge. But fortunately, at least you know that everyone is going to have the same amount of nothing to deal with, you know, like trying to hit everything and make it compelling always means that it's not compelling for any of them, really. Like you try your best, I'm not saying uh, that the, the, the VR workspace experience isn't compelling, but what I am saying is, is it's like, if you can amp up and say, we definitely have the best VR ever, you can really focus to make that good, and if you have only low-end devices, you can, you can work to make that the best as possible. Doing both is like heavy compromises. So the pro on this is it's like it's designed for classrooms. It's a very simple application, super accessible. Um, you don't actually need that powerful phones to do VR if you keep the graphics nice. The cons is you're limited by graphics. Um, and uh, you know, like I said, there's no controllers. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, you, you have to do stuff like put a disc from here to here and a player will want to reach it, but instead they have to like stare at it for a second and then the animation will kind of like represent it. Um, so accessible, that's the pro. The con is you can't really interact with it. Now this uh, Last Taxi is sort of like the full-fledged VR game that we're making. It's being built for only high-end devices, so we don't have to worry about mobile phones or anything else. It's actually the only first project in here that is like only focused on those high-end devices, which is, is nice. Um, the design differences on this one is we're looking for an, like an eight hour gameplay experience, which in, it, I mean, uh, Half-Life's game will be out when this releases, so there'll be other lengthy experiences, but there still isn't a lot of really media experiences in VR. They're mostly like little demos or like fun mini games. Um, it's narrative driven. In fact, the whole game is like, uh, every conversation is like uh, branching. So to like drive a game, VR game that's narrative based is, is unusual and it's actually conversation based. Like the most of the game you're having conversations with people and we're trying to leverage that virtual reality to like make characters connect with you in a more uh, real way. You know, that, like cause they're in your space, they're sort of nearby. Um, so yeah, on top of that, um, we, we created a, a, as big of a world as we could. The actual footprint of the game is bigger than the world in GTA V. Um, pending whether that was a good thing for me to try to do or not, because scope is always tough. Um, but then the other thing is uh, we're, we're do using locomotion constantly in this game because you're a flying taxi, and locomotion is extremely hard to execute well in VR. And, and what that ends up doing in terms of con, like pro, it's cool, you're flying around, it feels good. Con is your whole design is crushed down to make that work. Um, and so y there's a lot of things you couldn't do. Like if we were to do this game as like on a normal console, you know, you'd probably have like the taxi do barrel rolls to avoid obstacles and, and all kinds of crazy maneuvers and you can't do any of that. And then to tie that in, we sort of have to set a top speed on the game to make sure that nobody gets sick. And we also have conversations, so you wanna make sure that the conversation with the passengers start and end in the duration of the journey. So there's a lot of like, and all of that means that there's a lot of stuff you can't do to make that work. Um, so it's always good to keep in mind like what the output point and design of your product is and what the like limitations and strengths of stuff you're working on is. Um, so this one has a lot of pros and cons and it's the most VR thing so it, it's maybe worth it. The pro of doing this stuff is it's, you know, VR is extremely immersive. Um, 
you know, on the high-end devices, you can reach out and touch stuff. You, you feel fully surrounded by the world, um, which, when it's not in a toxic environment, <laughs> can be pretty good. Um, and, and, and for us, we really tried to leverage uh, a lot of environmental storytelling. Um, the con is that to make this world truly immersive, you know, like we went for a stylistic design so that we could have scope, but it would run. Because if you want it to look hyper-realistic, you're going to blow your computer up, basically, right? So it has to hit this high performance rate, uh, you know, 90 frames a second on two eyes at whatever resolution those devices are. Um, so there's that friction between, like, it's immersive, so it feels real, but you can't really make it look really real because the performance just won't allow it unless it's a very confined experience. Uh, pro, you can interact with your environment, you know, use motion controls in 360. The whole dashboard interior is, like, you know, these controls that you can mix and match and move around and use the wiper and use the horn and uh, hijack drones and things like that. And that's sort of naturally, uh, f well, I wouldn't say it's naturally fun because if it comes out and people are like, it was not naturally fun, Corey, it was naturally terrible. Um, you know, there is some finesse to that, but like the, the desire to reach out and grab things is something that no other medium has really accomplished. You know, like film, you can't touch anything. Other video games, it's like press A to watch a character flip a switch. That's what makes it feel really, really connected. Um, but the, the thing is, every VR device today has like a different way of doing that. So the actual hardest part to hit, even all the high-end platforms, is like, well, this one tracks my fingers, and this one does, and then this one, the, 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 the triggers feel good, but in this one, the triggers are in a weird place. And to like make everything compatible for all of that is actually probably the toughest thing design-wise in terms of mating all of those devices. Um, Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, they'll send you it. Right, yeah, you'll get, you'll get they'll the say, hey, here's our new controller to put into your game. Yeah. And you're like, is it compatible with the old one? Can it? No, there's some new stuff you got to do. Um, the, the biggest pro for, uh, from a creator standpoint is, is sort of related to a, a similar con. Limited competitors means you have a shot at standing out. It's pretty hard as an artist or a creative or a filmmaker or anything to really stand out. And we know from Winnipeg that people can stand out. Like uh, the, one of the most popular indie games ever made for virtual reality is Job Simulator, which was made largely by people here. And they were acquired by Google. Like, so you can, you can do it. The con is, the reason you're standing out is because not a lot of people have the device. It doesn't make a lot of money. So like your top end, you know, hitting, being an Angry Birds in terms of success versus being a Job Simulator in terms of success, the maximum amount of money and fame and like people who play it is smaller. So you can have a bigger piece of a small pie. What makes that worse is it's also more expensive to develop. For, so it's like a double-edged sword. You're working on the most difficult technically and most expensive medium for the smallest audience. You know, you can take that how you want in terms of what you're going to release and what you're going to do, but those are the stakes. But you hope that if you put out something good enough, because the market's small, it'll stand out a bit. Um, I mean, that's basically the end, and I saw my timer said I was over, which I thought I was talking pretty fast, but, you know. Um, I'll just quickly, if I can, just show um, some clips of the environments in Last Taxi. big world, it's hard to make that performant. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of working across all these mediums, the key thing is to have a vision and find strong, talented people to execute. I don't know how to code. I'm incredulous to most coders, to be honest with you. They have this nice chip on their shoulder. Do you know how to code? Sort of? A little bit? A little bit? A little bit? See? Exactly. We don't know. You find people who know. And you, you just have to have that strong vision that you bring to every other medium you work in. Because I don't see any of these memes as being ultimately different. You just need a vision and the ability to like just have it feel very terrible the whole process and then release it and then do it again. That's the creative process. It's great. <laughs> That's the end of my talk. Thanks so much, Corey. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, I'm going to share a little bit about my work. And I'm going to show one project um, that kind of sparked me moving towards VR. Um, and then the rest will be uh, a, from a recent work. Um, 
that uh, is a live performance that engages with VR, and I'd say in some ways it's more about VR and the related technologies as they enter the consumer market now than, than it is using that technology. So, um, yeah, my, my most formal training in, in, in the arts came from dance, but I was always concurrently involved with the production of images, whether it was drawing, painting, I inherited a brass body camera, so I was doing a lot of photography, and I had a video camera, no tools to edit, because we didn't have computers when I was growing up in my house very much. Um, um, and then, uh, so, but always interested in production of images, and so it took me quite a while in my pra to like have to figure out how my dance and performance interests would come together with my interests in um, images, and it led me towards technology. So, um, yeah, so the position I'm in now at York University is, uh, came around with the title of screen dance, which I haven't always associated with my work with, but it's around choreography for camera. It is also about um, uh, artists who work with projections um, uh, and the live body. So anything that's sort of interfacing with uh, screen and movement. So the project that just led me to VR, the title is called Consistent Partial Attention. This is a project I did in 2016 with uh, myself and two other dancers, Lise McMillan from uh, Manitoba and James Phillips from Montreal. And the title came from uh, a reference to uh, Linda Stone, who worked for Microsoft, and she talked about consistent partial attention being a state of different than multitasking. So we're casting a wide net of attention, waiting for whatever incoming bings and pings across devices and platforms that make us constantly kind of switching tasks more regularly. Um, so it's not about simultaneity, it's about, yeah. Um, uh, this sort of half a paying attention to everything that we're doing. And I thought that was very much like a performer did as an improviser. I'll start my timer. Um, uh, where you're paying attention to the lighting, the people that you're engaging with, you're responding to music, you're responding to spatial environments. And uh, so in this project, um, we worked with a video score for the performers. So they would sight read the score off monitors on stage, um, whether they were laptops, projection screens. Um, and in the last section of the work, um, they wore video glasses um, that were just like, like little, little, little televisions so they'd go sideways when you moved your head. Um, and on those sources, they would see, um, I've always been interested about, uh, about technology in the domestic space, and these were all, I found videos on YouTube of people um, improvising um, in front of their computer in the home. So I would use search terms like, um, uh, kitchen, dancing, uh, den, dancing, uh, living room, dancing. And then I had a harder time sometimes finding a broad base of uh, people engaging in those spaces. So sometimes I'd have to say male, improvisation, dance, or dancing, kitchen, you know, just to find a broader base of uh, people. And um, so this little section that I'll show is um, just that only the section with the video glasses. And so the sensation of performing and the screen being that close to your face and it sort of, you know, omitting the rest of the stage space that we are in, I really quite enjoyed this sense of disorientation and also kind of the live processing of an image we'd see to then what it would impact how, how we move physically. So as performers, we mostly replicated um, and tried to basically make learning evidence. So what we were seeing, we were do doing live. We were live processing, so we didn't know the choreography. So this section, there's um, uh, multiple sources from the web, so it's kind of a remix. I won't show too long of it, just give you a taste. Yeah, and they're just like little squares, the same in both eyes. Yeah. 
Um, in that section, no. In some sections of the work, we did have a projection of what the source was that we were seeing, but for me, it was less about who those dancers were, and, and I was trying to kind of sort of dislocate those original dancers from who did them, where they were, and all the signifiers of identity in a sense of, you know, the things that you read from the posters on the wall to the clothing that they're wearing to the original music. Um, so we kind of wanted to look at dance in the everyday, in the domestic space, in front of the computer, and what motivates us and how, how, how we're moved. Um, and I less looked at pop, I, did, I looked for ones that weren't too much referencing popular dance styles. I looked for people who were just kind of in a responsive moment of engagement. Um, and so then that uh, sense of disorientation really interested me and, and I had so many of my works prior to that had been had video very dominant and so that work I put the video driving the work but not so visual for the audiences and then I was like okay now I want to do something with video more in 360 uh, maybe maybe a live feed 360 projections less centralized to like a fixed screen behind me which a lot of my work had been um, so I thought I was going to make a project with 360 video and I applied to a residency in Portland that was about AR and VR for artists um, they were interested in getting people who didn't ac have access to some of these tools to get sort of like a crash course on it for nine days and get working with them. So I went to this residency and it was hosted by Oregon Storyboard, iBeam, which is in New York, and Up4 Gallery. And, um, and it kind of um, changed the trajectory of my project and also kind of got me really excited <laughs> about some of the emergent tech. Um, uh, and because I think in the first day I was able to try out a motion capture suit, which I hadn't realized how both it's more affordable, <laughs> still a little bit steep, but how quickly it was to, to animate and to get engaging with three-dimensional space. And having been someone who always did this sort of 2D video and relationship to a live body, I was like being able to kind of explore within three-dimensional space and or create for that, um, uh, I, I felt like well, it was just opening up new doors for where my work might go. Um, so as a result of my time there, I was just playing with ready-made assets that I'd find online, so uh, avatars that already exist, which has kind of been a lot of my process has been working with content that exists already on the internet and um, collaborating with <laughs> those tools that are there. And um, so one of the pieces I made was called um, Painting with the Man, and it was a single channel, it is a single channel video, so just a single screen, 2D. Um, I've been showing it at festivals and um, called Painting with the Man. I did the movement that animates this figure in the video, and um, to me it references Eve Klein, um, uh, an American painter who did a series of works um, where uh, females were, used, nude female bo bodies were covered in blue paint and putting their body onto canvases for a, in front of a live performance. So in this sense I'm animating and he wears a blue suit and he um, leaves digital traces in a sense. So I'm just going to play a little clip of this, um, painting with a man. dances I did in this was also from that previous project, Consistent Parcel Attention. So one was a four-year-old dancer that I'm replicating, and the other was a 40-year-old. Um, so I don't know which one's which. You know, you might have a quick read on which one's which, but <laughs> um, yeah. And this uh, sort of held um, images uh, in terms of like the replication and the painting effect is, it was an error. Um, it wasn't clearing the buffer. And um, I thought this was perfect that I'm gonna screen record this and I have a piece. <laughs> so uh, sometimes I really have worked to sort of uh, embrace, embrace glitch, embrace the unexpected and know that the tools you're working with aren't gonna quite do necessarily what you think they're gonna do most of the time. <laughs> And um, so from that, the, my interest in motion capture, I started looking online at, at um, uh, uh, 
checking. Uh, uh, I, I started looking online at what kind of content people were creating um, and how they were creating with motion capture. So I found, I gathered a whole lot of footage of people in the domestic space of the home and from what I could tell, maybe not all of it, but I was looking at sort of a motion capture that people had um, done as tests and put online. And so I was interested in kind of the movement language people would do to test the responsivity of their moving in front of whatever device is capturing their motion and then um, seeing their avatar and sort of looking at that, that space in between and how they're in response to that. And so I created a work uh, that's part of this larger performance and this section, um, the, the original, there's a human who does motion capture. We see the avatar that they've animated, which has a reduction of information in terms of things like it doesn't breathe, you know, it, there's some things that are missing. And then I've returned it back to my own body, both to experience sort of their experience in between those two spaces and in some sense also see what's missing. Um, and the text that goes along with it was, um, um, I was listening to people on YouTube talk about out of body experiences. Um, so I'll just play this. But you also have disembodied beings that you can see. I see them all the time around me, but I see them more frequently when I look at others. So I was also curious in terms of what types of avatars, in terms of figures that are represented that people are animating, even in their first tests, um, and what kind of movements we do when we're embodying certain figures or certain avatars. Um, so this interest in motion capture also sparked a, a couple little collaborations with an artist called Will Pappenheimer, who's based in New York. Um, he's a professor at Pace University, who's a member of um, Manifest AR, an early collective. Um, who did a project called We AR in MoMA in 2010, and they did it. A, they created sculptures that existed in AR in between all these other sculptures that were actually in the space, and they just rogue flyered and had a bunch of people show up with their phones to come check out their AR exhibition, which I think was really lovely. They also wrote an interesting manifesto about augmented reality. Um, so we did a couple little collaborations where I would just send motion capture files, and then later we did a little time in Montreal together where we both brought motion capture suits and recorded some movement that would be of interest to both our own pro our, our individual projects. Um, so this is a little clip of an installation. He did a, a, a piece in response to another a sculptor and his exhibition. So this is uh, the AR overlaid on top of the actual exhibition space. So there was a number of artists that did AR responses to this sculptural exhibition. So I, so I drove the, the movement of these male figures. Um, and I'm sure he would say a lot more about his work than I'll have time to today. Will Pappenheimer, you can find out about him online. Um, but also just that ease with which you can sort of collaborate through the digital space and through data is also quite uh, interesting uh, in terms of its possibilities and how dance can move and have a different kind of permanence and or space and presence than just the, what's usually most privileged in terms of going like, I'm a dancer, I'm live, <laughs> I'm in the flesh. And that's how I expect hopefully that we experience that in real time together. So I'm really curious about these other spaces, temporalities and ways of um, sharing and exploring movement. Um, so another, maybe I'll show two, no. Um, yeah, so I'll show two little other sections of the work um, that I did. Um, this one uh, of the larger performance about VR. This one is kind of an extension of the painting with the man. Um, 
piece, so I'll just play it. I worked with uh, an artist in San Francisco at a residency, um, and he worked on some of the interaction coding for this project, because Yagiz Mungan works a lot in industry in San Francisco. If you choose to believe you vibrate in a higher vibration, then you can start influencing your environment. See it. This was another section of the work with texts about out-of-body experiences or um, sort of overlaid with um, uh, a different perception of reality in terms of me being in immersed game space. Um, then one further way that sort of that influence of that residency and the early beginnings of my exploration with VR influenced this project, this larger performance called Motion After Effect, is um, the final scene of the work where I'm doing sort of live painting. The entire stage has a green screen floor on it and, um, and a live web camera from above. And so uh, there's one section where I'm using, I'm, the live camera feed goes into Unity, the game software, and um, there's a motion capture figure, so 3D. Um, and I, you, the green screen effect that I use just has inherently produces that glitch that I had discovered by accident. Um, so it produces those sort of trails. Um, and so it, it became a su substantial section of the work. Um, so I'll just show a little bit that, so you can kind of see from 2D video how then it came into the, into the theater space. drove the movement for that avatar as well in terms of the motion capture. So just a taste, just to keep us on time so that we have some opportunities for conversations. I will eventually put a little clips of some sections of this work online so you can get a chance. And hopefully I'll ch find a chance to show it again in Winnipeg. But that section, Emma Hendricks at the back did sound for. And, uh, and Lise McMillan was the uh, virtual presence in the green screen suit, uh, Winnipeg dancer. Um, so, yeah, I guess I, with my play with VR and AR, I've been trying to... Um, just uh, embrace the unexpected, and we, we had a comment in terms of how things sometimes become obsolete, or you're always like on the opening night of our show day, Oculus did an update, and I connected to the internet for like five minutes to download a file, and then um, I, I ran into a problem that things weren't running as they were hope they're supposed to for that opening night, so it kind of led me to errors for, it wasn't consistent that the VR section worked for every night. So things I have to work towards in terms of finding, I've been learning from mostly having been Mac-based to working on PC, to figuring out how to make something stable, and robust for show. Also learning in some ways, people have always told, I've heard this from a number of people saying VR is really, if you're gonna create for it, it's often it best in some ways if you think about it as a collaborative tool. Like it's hard to c cultivate all the skills to do all aspects of it, whether it's the, the code, the 3D modeling, what have you. Um, and I was mostly kind of persisting as doing a lot on my own. The, so at some points it's also really beneficial to think about collaborating. Um, but that temporality as a dance artist I've always been comfortable with in some ways. It, it's, it's fleeting and it doesn't always stay the same. It's not repeatable. It's and like less temporal now actually. Yeah. Because there's a digital thing that stays. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, and then I've also been curious about in terms of work that's with digital, in terms of how it has some permanence. Um, I did a project in, uh, called Avatar in 2009, which has been invited. There's um, Canada Playwrights Press is doing an anthology on digital theater in Canada, and I've been invited to translate it as a score or a script. But having been a piece that was largely driven with video content throughout the entire thing, I'm really 
kind of perplexed and curious about what does this look like and um, for who is this for restaging? Um, so do I tell them the key search terms I use to create the video content that was wish the original performance work? Or yeah, so it's quite quite curious to think about the sort of translation of the digital to other mediums the as user well. Guide. Yeah, <laughs> user guys. Yeah, user guys, how to make this work? <laughs> Your own version of because uh, it would be a very different number of years from now. Um, I think that's probably enough to, yeah, just embrace the intentional misuse, the glitches, the weird, weird workflows, and the unintended, and to approach the cu computer with a curiosity, um, with no expectation it'll do what you want, because things are always shifting and changing. Great, thank you, Freya. <laughs> wow, what a incredible diversity of, uh, applications for, for a medium. It's uh, really interesting to see where the artistic and commercial uh, potentials of uh, VR uh, might be going. Um, so everyone kind of stuck in their uh, time slots uh, fairly well, but I think what I'll, well, we're, we're, we're at four o'clock right now. So I think what we'll do is uh, maybe we'll open the questions up to the audience uh, because you, I'm sure they're far more insightful than anything I have. Um, so now is your time to maybe Ask, ask the participants anything you want. And it's, it's small enough that you can just kind of maybe yell it out. People uh, are fleeing, though. Yeah. Uh, maybe just a bathroom. Uh, maybe, hopefully just a bathroom break. But for those who are left, just uh, feel free to, uh, to, to ask your questions. Two pieces that um, were different answers. Uh, the, the earlier piece is the more interesting one. Um, and I, when I started the piece, I, I wanted to make a holographic soundscape so you, you you move through a sound composition by by sort of you know lo locomotion in from one one sort of sound cloud to another uh, the, what I did was I I hacked a script that would uh, measure your position and I, I tied it to uh, a pitch pitch in the uh, in the um, audio um, and speed of the the playback. Um, so basically, w w where you'd move, it would just modulate the whole the whole sound composition. So it was sort of a very um, simple but uh, effective um, trick. Um, I, I do uh, I do all the production in, in in my work usually, except for the collaborative work. Um, so the the more recent VR works, they're they're. Uh, mostly just sort of looped sounds, uh, but also, I mean, one of the amazing things about VR is is to to be able to spatialize audio in, in a way, not just sort of stereographically, but but to sort of have events that happen. I, I think I always thought it was a very interesting thing for um, for sound composers uh, to to do, and I, I you know I, I imagine there's a lot of work out there that's like that, but um, yeah, no. It's what I'm doing is very simple, though. It's uh, it's, it's sort of looping, and um, you know, you can place sounds in the avatar's head that are sort of a bad track, and you know, it's yeah. Sorry, does that, that answer your question? Yeah. I'll just jump in with some shameless promotion. Uh, Les uh, is going to be doing a workshop on spatial audio. Uh, very in in January sometime. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the the details are on Video Pool's website. You can see uh, what's all going to be encompassed in that workshop, and the dates uh, are going to be uh, are going to be amended for uh, mid January. Like I said, the, in the piece, it, it drew lots of research um, around esoteric um, subjects, um, just math, code. Uh, cosmology. Um, so there's a lot of stuff piled in there, but I, I was interested in um, in in the idea of in, uh, infinite collapse and um, implosion. Um, so the Taurus is this uh, sort of f fractal a cycle that uh, where it folds in on itself. Um, sort of was a device for um, enfolding the spheres and having sort of this sort of nested concept of spheres within spheres. We've kind of, uh, all of you have sort of alluded to the fact that the, the barriers for entry for content creators are kind of uh, diminishing and uh, there's lots of uh, free tools and um, lots of uh, different capabilities. What about from the consumer's point of view? What do you think needs to happen for, for, for this medium to be more widely adopted uh, by, by 
by everyone because there's so many applications we hear from, uh, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, people dealing with dementia uh, and, and VR or, or training purposes or entertainment purposes. What do we need to really do to get uh, the consumer excited about adopting this medium? Uh, it needs to be cheaper and simpler to use, basically. I think Ocu the new Oculus stuff is probably the best so far. Uh, unfortunately, my game's too heavy to play on that, probably. But uh, in terms of, like, there's no other things. You just stick it on your head. And the onboarding, like, the getting you into it is very good. Uh, but I, I, I'm honestly not even sure that... I kind of question how big the audience is ultimately going to be. You know, like we're sitting, like when I was in university, I studied film and philosophy, and I was like, film is going to be dead because VR is just so freaking crazy and AR is so crazy, and yet we're in the golden age of like television content. Um, and, and there's something that's just like not having that rest restrictiveness on your face. Um, I'll, pass, I'll pass it on. The one thing I do want to say, though, that in terms of being a creator that works across mediums, that is the hardest part, is not the technology, it's the cultural you know, somebody may look at your work and you might go to a game dev firm and they're like, it's too artsy and then the vice versa can happen. I know when I started to get into games from film, there was a lot of like, not another film guy who thinks he's gonna make games. Um, so literally I think it's people's perception of what you're capable of and what a collaboration can yield that is the biggest barrier to creative crossing paths. Uh, personally, I, I think I'm just speculating on a commercial side. Uh, but uh, that it is an entirely new medium, um, all of these mediums, uh, augmented and virtual and XR. Um, and it's really, uh, I think when it first emerged commercially, there was an expectation that, uh, th that it would be a ga the gamers would you know, pick up the, the whole slack. And it, it just, none of the gaming companies made, made titles for it. Like it just doesn't work for, the conventional video games, except maybe like, you know, the simple, the, the simple children's games or something. Um, but uh, yeah, and it just gives you motion sickness as you as you travel through it. So. No, no, it doesn't at all. And yeah. So I don't. I don't think the the game, like the industry, didn't didn't get their heads around it, and they haven't made made the appropriate content for it. It's, it's a new form, and, uh, and uh, I, I think it'll, it, may, it may go away for a few years and Hopefully not. come maybe, back. Maybe wait till I feel the medical clear. <laughs> I, well, I, th I just think really it's, uh, you gotta let the generation, there's this gener generations, like people get old and they move on, and pe young people come in and they take up space and the medium shifts and it's probably a two decade process. Like there's a combination of how comfortable you are with the technology. Are you exposed to it when you go to the supermarket? Are you exposed to it when you go to the art gallery? Are you exposed to it at work? You know, as more applications come into the workspace, people are going to be exposed to it at work. So uh, I think it's a combination of a lot of things that are very challenging to predict. I do kind of think games have a little bit of uh, something going for it. Not because I don't think, like I agree with what you're saying, the games aren't the best translation. Um, but I think... Games are a good way to market it to young people, and I think really that's a thing. It's a more of like, and then Facebook will pour billions of dollars into it. So, all those things I think are just a blend of everything. But I don't know; it's See, it's unknown. What's interesting though is like other mediums didn't have this like terrible lag from when everyone. How long did it take for books to be published from the printing press? Well, books are special from because, storytelling well, or storytelling sure. to printing, yeah. Sure, but when the printing press was invented it exploded, like as soon as it became cheap. Um, iPhones were much quicker. Um, and, and the books are actually the best medium, I think, because they're the only ones that have lasted like 3,000, 4,000 years, and like, they're still compatible as long as you know the language. But um, uh, sh sh I was gonna say something, but I'm trying to remember. Oh, I was reading, I'm reading a book about like uh, the growth of consumer culture, and what's really strange is like technologies like television, when people start getting income, they buy a television before they buy a fridge, before they buy AC units, uh, you know, they feed their family, get a house, and then buy a television. And so there's something about that, where, uh, you know, people prioritizing that as something important in their lives as a cheap entertainment format. 
And I don't know why VR isn't there. Maybe it is the accessibility. Maybe it's because to really have my whole family do it, I got to buy five, you know, VR headsets or whatever. But there is something distinctly unique about it. And it could even just be the, like, monstrosity of putting it on your face. Like, remember when people had Google Glass? You'd look at those guys, and they were called glass heads or glass holes. Glass holes. Glass holes? Yeah. And it's like, it could literally just be that, like, technology dysphoria of, like, this I still feel is not me even though it's like largely me, it's got all my information on it. Whereas this, it's like bolted to my head in a way that I think like is not sexy. Like you see those conferences of Mark Zuckerberg walking through and everyone's got this thing and it looks like an apocalyptic movie, you know? And, and, and not to say that it won't get there, but the value proposition is extremely hard to express and we showed everything in videos. And so if, if, if you guys haven't been in VR, some of these videos might be somewhat incomprehensible in terms of to how the experience would feel. I can imagine what yours looks like because I feel like I have some grounding with VR. But without that, you're showing me a 2D thing trying to sell a 3D thing. That's, that's, that's tough. I think that's a great point. I think uh, I see some hands ra raising up. Uh, just qu quick question here. Who's been in, like, like in, a, in a Rift or in like kind of a high-end uh, 3D headset here? Has, has everyone kind of experienced VR? Okay. Okay, great. Um, any other questions? Uh, oh, I, had, I had one more thing to add to that. I was just, just uh, I remember reading somewhere, I can't remember, they said like VR as a technology has been, our capabilities have been around for a long time to, in, to, to make content for it and to make it more available, but industry and people with the money deciding what tech to push forward weren't investing and it's been part of feeling like society wasn't ready, <laughs> not isolated enough to want to like have the screen right in their face. We're there now. So it's <laughs> just like, just, you know, so, just yeah. give it a couple more years or yeah, just gonna go, keep going in yeah. and in and in. It was, the TV was here and then the TV was here and then you're on the bus like this. And now it's, now like it's in bed. Yeah. Mm. My sister puts chips, her laptop chips. here. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Brain chips. The motion sickness thing too, I think has been very damaging. Like the fact that s like any big publisher would release a game that actually makes people physically ill, that's not a good way to onboard people. You know, like the TV doesn't make me vomit. Some of the content makes me feel sick inside, but like I don't physically get ill playing, like watching television usually. Um, uh, well, yeah, I'm saying content can, but it's not the same. It's not like a physiological sickness. It's like a, an emotional a sickness. And, and so like that's hard. Like if you just stick a thing on a person's head, be like, this is the next great thing. And it's like, whoa, and they're like, whoa. You killed that. I think you killed that user for a long time, basically. And a lot of the early first gen stuff did that, which I think was kind of a travesty. I think none of that I think if Google, Apple's Google I think if Apple was the first one to come out with VR, they would not put those yeah. games on the store. Yeah. You know, and it would have been probably better in the long run. But whatever. It is what it is. Great. Okay, well, uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to wrap it up here. I just want to thank all our presenters for sharing their time and their expertise and their passion with all of us here today. Um, I'm sure they might stick around. If you've got some personal questions, you might want to ask them individually about VR. Uh, and I think we want to take a group photo, a proper one as well, too. Um, so once again, thanks for joining us. Uh, please check the Creative Manitoba website. We've got loads uh, more presentations, roundtables, uh, and other great activities coming around the uh, emerging mindsets. Uh, so once again, thanks everyone for being here.